In this video, I want to give you a brief history of photo manipulation, brief and um, a little bit fleeting. I can't cover every detail because it's actually a very long and complicated history, but I want to give you some highlights. There's a misconception among many people that photo manipulation uh, really emerged with the invention of digital photography and contemporary softwares, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, photo manipulation emerged pretty much as soon as photography was invented in 1839. Now, the first photo I'm going to show you is from just a little bit later than that. This is from 1851. Uh, but the photographer Gustave Le Gray was one of the very first practitioners uh, in France of photography and one of the first to pioneer this composite method. So what you're looking at is a composite landscape. The sky and the, the land, the ship and the, and the ocean are two different photographs, two different places, two different times. This is designed to solve a problem not at all unlike the problem that the HDR process solves today, as we saw in the video. But uh, it was a little more extreme then. Early emulsions, they weren't films yet, but early emulsions that we that were used to, uh, to record images in the camera were very, very sensitive to blue light and very insensitive to red light and just a little bit sensitive to green light. So the landscapes, the actual land part of them, needed to be exposed for a very long time in order to get an exposure. Meanwhile, the skies, which were blue, would completely blow out. They would get completely white and unprintable. So the solution was to create separate photos uh, with separate exposures and then composite them together in the darkroom. So this is really one of the world's first composites. Gustave Le Gray was, was quite an innovator. And he was also, like many of the early photographers, he was trained in the tradition of painting and he uh, thought about photography as emulating painting. This is a very important theme in early photography and in some of these photo manipulations. Uh, so his photographs, while we might look at them now and feel like they're a little awkward or not technically perfect as photographs, he realized that he was trying to create the feeling and the mood more of a painting. And look at, the, these really are quite spectacular. Look at the waves in the foreground. These really are very reminiscent of those mid 19th century landscape paintings. And a really imaginative and technically uh, difficult solution to a problem of early photography. Now, uh, the composite photo was carried much further just a few years later in 1857 in this very famous and somewhat odd <laughs> photograph by Oscar Raylander. I always giggle just a little bit when I look at this photo because it's, it's very strange. It's, uh, it really, to our eyes now, looks like a somewhat awkward Photoshop, and it really is very much like Photoshop. This is a composite of 36 photographs. Uh, and I'll show you one of the, the individuals in a second. Uh, but the, Oscar Raylander was part of a group of photographers, mostly wealthy white men, because they could afford the time and the money to do this, who were playing with photography and really determined to prove that photography could be an art. Many people were skeptical. It was a machine. A machine couldn't be creative. A machine could simply record what was in front of it. And one of the ways that photographers tried to prove that photography could be an art was to try to make it look as much as possible like painting and try to, try to make it more plastic, that is more malleable. Uh, so Raylander photographed, uh, 30, made 36 different photographs at different times in his studio to create this parable of the two, two ways of life. There's uh, this young man here who is trying to decide between um, a life of drinking and hanging around with naked women or a life of working and hanging around with clothed women. Now, check out this little area here because I'm going to show you this next slide, that is the original study for The Two Ways of Life uh, from 1857. So uh, he would create them against a dark background, which you'll see also coming up in the next photographer, which is also technically really smart. It's the way that we still actually work when we're planning composites. It's much better to photograph against uh, often a dark background or a solid background, or even the green screen has the same kind of purpose. So very technically astute early on in photography.
Uh, Ray Lander made a number of interesting composites. He was an interesting uh, photographer and artist, not appreciated so much in his time. His themes actually are uh, really dreamlike. This is called Poor Joe and uh, a little bit trippy, <laughs> for lack of a better expression. Uh, this particular photograph is a self-portrait and it's entitled Raylander the Artist Introduces Raylander the Volunteer. And by volunteer, he meant soldier in our contemporary parlance. Uh, these themes that he worked with were really somewhat uh, surreal. Uh, the surrealists weren't going to come around for another 70 years, so he was ahead of his time. And also, this kind of work has reemerged in a more recent history with the emergence of contemporary technologies. So this is a friend of Oscar Raylander made this photograph, Fading Away, another very famous early composite manipulated photograph. This was made from about 10 different photos. Now, unlike Raylander, uh, Henry Peach Robinson is the photographer here. Uh, his work, especially later on, <clears throat> rather than uh, printing these in the, doing each uh, uh, exposure separately in the darkroom, he would make the separate photos and then he actually did this very careful uh, cutting and pasting and then re-photographing. And they're really quite precise and quite amazing. Uh, I like Henry Peach Robinson. He was a smart man. Uh, he was kind of cheesy and kind of a showman, uh, but he he really had an understanding of, uh, of what photography could do. And one of his famous lines in his speech was that uh, photography could lie and lie like a Trojan. And his sense was that if photography can lie, it is an art because that's one of the things art does. And again, let me just show you one of the images. This wasn't the final image, but this was one of the images he took in preparation. Um, really, again, recognizing that dark background. If you Google Fading Away uh, by uh, Henry Peach Robinson, you'll get a lot of information. Now, <clears throat> I have to say one of the things that strikes me about Henry Peach, and I am a fan of Henry Peach Robinson, but he, I think he was just trying to prove something. I'm not sure that his work was uh, itself was worthy, but his process was really interesting. I mean, if you look at this and you see all of the elaborate uh, work that he went to to create these composite photos, you kind of think, well, maybe he should have just painted it. He was a very good painter, um, but he, he's a very interesting man. Okay, now speaking of painting, uh, another early manipulation that we see in photography, and we, we continue to see this too today, but it came on very early, uh, was hand coloring. <clears throat> so this photograph is from the late 19th century. I believe this is sometime in the 1870s. This is a photograph by the Japanese photographer Kusakabe Kimbei. And Kusakabe Kimbei really is considered the first Japanese photographer. Uh, so he really essentially brought photography to Japan, although actually it was brought to him. Uh, a European photographer, Felix Beato, uh, traveled to Japan very shortly after it opened to the West. It had been closed to the West for hundreds of years, and so Westerners had never seen what Japan looked like, and they were very curious. So Beato was an early traveler. He brought photography with him, and he set up a photo studio and made photographs of Japanese scenes. He hired uh, Kusakabe Kimbei as an assistant, taught him the trade, and when he left Japan, he got bored, he moved on, because that was kind of the way Beato was, he left him the studio. And uh, Kusakabe Kimbei became very famous and really was probably instrumental in bringing photography to Japan. But I digress. Uh, so this is a beautiful hand-painted Kusakabe Kimbei studio photograph. And uh, these photographs that Kimbei made, uh, interestingly enough, were also the start of what we would think of as uh, postcards, travel postcards. Uh, they were primarily marketed to the new tourist trade, the Westerners coming into Japan, who would buy these postcards uh, to send, to bring home or to send home, but also uh, they would actually uh, send them to Europe as, uh, as things to be purchased there. The Europeans were fascinated with Japan because it was uh, something that they had not seen before because it had been closed so long. 
Now, hand coloring was also part of portraiture. Uh, one of my favorite uh, comments from Susan Sontag is that discovering that photos could be retouched made getting your portrait made much more popular in these very early days of photography. Two of the primary things that people did not like about photography was that they didn't like seeing themselves as they actually were. The actual experience of seeing yourself in a photograph, just as it is today, was quite uncomfortable. Uh, they also didn't like that they weren't in color. And so hand coloring photographs, which started right away with daguerreotypes and continues on uh, until color photography was invented and even after that, was a way of actually smoothing out, beautifying, and making these portraits look, well, a little more like paintings. And there's a, another example of a child. Now, this is one of my favorite territories of photo manipulation, uh, spirit photography. So this is a really late 19th century into the early 20th century. And really spirit photography continues this to, the, to this day, uh, but takes slightly different forms. Uh, but in the late 19th century, it actually became kind of big business. Uh, and people were so unfamiliar with how photography actually worked that most people didn't understand how easy it was to to fabricate or to manipulate photos. So you see these early daguerreotypes um, with the uh, with the the effigies or the the ghosts of uh, the the people behind them appearing in the photograph. Uh, people paid big money for this, and there was actually a very famous photographer who was named uh, Mumler. And Mumler, I, uh, there's actually been a lot written about Mumler uh, because he was almost certainly a charlatan, that is, he was faking it, uh, but he never got caught. He was even taken to court and he got away with it, essentially. It's an interesting story. This is a photograph by Mumler. He had a studio, he had famous clients, uh, they would come in and, and he would, they were guaranteed basically that when the photograph came out, uh, they would be there with their departed loved ones. Quite extraordinary photos. Now his most famous client, uh, this is from 1872, was Mary Todd Lincoln, the widow of Abraham Lincoln. And you can see Abraham leaning over and uh, uh, holding her shoulders in this uh, Mumler photograph. Uh, really one of my very favorite stories. And there was also really aesthetic and kind of intriguing spirit photography. And I don't know, some, some spirit photography was intended to be um, more uh, humorous or aesthetic. Um, but people did not know how photographs work, and so they took them quite seriously. Now, here's one of my favorite stories in the history of photo manipulation. I think you'll enjoy this. This is the story of the Cottingley Fairies. A pair of young girls, they were, I believe, 10 and 12 at the time. They had been gifted one of the early uh, compact cameras by Kodak. Uh, so this is, I believe, very early 20th century. I believe it was in 1910, 1912. I'll have to look that date up. They went out in their backyard and they photographed the fairies that were there. Now, when we look at these photos, and that's one of the young girls hanging out with the fairies. When we look at these photos, it, it seems pretty clear to us that these are fabrications, correct? And uh, the fun thing about the Cottingley fairy stories are two things that I quite love. And one was that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the writer of Sherlock Holmes, uh, was absolutely enamored of the Cottingley fairies. He fervently believed in them, that they were actual fairies, and believed it um, until the day of his death. Now, the girls, on the other hand, they also kept mum. They would never fess up that they had faked the Cottingley fairies until mm, they were in their 80s, which was in the late uh, 20th century, and they finally said, yeah, we faked it. <laughs> which I really enjoyed. Um, it was a kind of a wonderful, long, long joke. Here's a, a, a little different kind of manipulation, which was actually very transparent manipulation. Nobody, uh, the, the photographer in question, didn't cover up the fact that he was actually uh, doing uh, additions to the photos, but it created a bit of a kerfuffle. Uh, this is a photo photograph by Edward Muybridge. This is actually uh, some of his notes um, on his 1879 photograph 
of a running horse. And I'll show you the more famous ones in a second. He did these uh, for Leland Stanford. Uh, Leland Stanford, that should sound familiar to you. He, Leland Stanford of Stanford University. Leland Stanford, who was the governor of California and the railroad magnet and very important uh, figure in California history. Uh, he engaged Muy Bridge to make these photographs of one of his uh, running horses, his trotters, uh, because he was had a the, the theory was that he had a bet with a friend about whether or not all four hooves of a horse came off the ground while they were running. Now nobody had ever been able to see this because horses run far too fast. Nobody really knew what a horse looked like when they were running. So these were fascinating photographs. They were done by using a series of trip wires. Um, and uh, if these look familiar, it's because you probably see these as a GIF before many of the movies that you go to back when we were going to movies. And yes, Muy Bridge was also a really important uh, innovator who was uh, part of the invention of the moving picture. Now, the story with the manipulation is he took the photographs, uh, the photographs worked but the emulsions at the time were so, so insensitive to light, they, there were pieces missing. They, not every little bit of the horse came through, and so he kind of painted them in. Well, that created a big controversy, everybody said. These are faked. Um, he's faked the whole thing, and uh, for years, until he could actually recreate those without that manipulation, people did not believe him. There's always been a connection between photo manipulation and the idea that photographs tell the truth, which is um, kind of an interesting and uh, not always straightforward uh, concept. Uh, the next group of photographers came uh, right on the heels of Muy Bridge, and these are the pictorialists. And the pictorialists were uh, a group that can sort of, they, they actually did emerge from the same group of artists of, of Ray Lander and Henry Peach Robinson. Uh, but this was towards the end of the 20th century, and they were very, very committed to uh, establishing a fine art practice in photography. One of the things that these photographers did was that they uh, manipulated their photos, again, to sort of help them resemble uh, paintings. And they did crazy stuff. Frank Eugene scratched on his photos. They also worked in these really wonderful alternative processes, which are coming back are very popular today. Uh, this is, I believe, by uh, Gertrude Casimir, uh, who was one of the really well-known female photographers in this time, and she worked with gum printing, she worked with alternative processes. And this is the, probably the most famous of these uh, pictorialist photographs. Uh, this was a, this is called Pond Moonlight by Edward Steichen, and at one point it was the highest selling photograph in history. It's a, a brome oil, which is a combination of photography and oil paint. Uh, and it's obviously very, very manipulated and expressive, not a realistic photo. It sold at auction uh, a number of years ago for 1.4, 1. 1. no, I think it was over 2 million, uh, but it has since been uh, usurped as the highest selling photograph in history, but it's very famous. The last of the pictorialists that I want to share with you is Anne Brigman, and Anne Brigman was a Californian. Uh, she was an early feminist and uh, she made these absolutely stunning uh, black and white photographs, uh, mostly of herself and her sister. Uh, they would hike into the California mountains and uh, they would uh, photograph, she would photograph them or uh, sometimes a friend. And they were meant to be these feminist uh, photographs that, uh, that were about um, the freedom and the independence and the strength of women. Uh, the manipulation part uh, was that she actually enhanced them, and this was her artistic prerogative. She would make them, she would print them, and then you can see, especially in this one, she would come in and she would enhance them with graphite pencil. So they have this sort of wonderful quality of looking like a drawing. Now I'm going to show you a couple of modern ones, and then I'm going to have you go take a look at a link that uh, talks about uh, photo manipulation in news photography. A little history on that. Uh, it's a kind of a whole different direction. But before I go, uh, let's take a look at David Hockney. David Hockney uh, is a multimedia artist, but he did a series of these amazing photo manipulations in the, uh, about 20 years ago, called Photo Joiners. Uh, 
where he would make multiple photos of the same scene and then collage them together. Another really interesting uh, contemporary photo manipulator was Lucas Samaras. He worked with one of the older processes of Polaroid, uh, which actually had this really, really soft emulsion. It would say st stay soft for a couple of hours. So you could make a photograph and then actually mush the Polaroid around. One of the reasons I like to show this is because we have a process in Photoshop that's pretty popular called liquify. And liquify really resembles, uh, we think of this resembling liquify, but liquify really was, uh, uh, was a, a version of this early Polaroid process. And the last person I want to show you in this particular show is Jerry Yulesman. And Jerry Yulesman, I would say, is probably one of the most famous, most adept, most extraordinary uh, non-digital photo manipulators in history. Uh, these are all done in the darkroom. Jerry Yulesman is still alive. He's still working in the darkroom. He makes, uh, each of these is composed of usually five, eight, or 10 different photographs. He makes them very deliberately and specifically uh, to go into these images. He pre-visualizes them as he's creating these other images. And then he works with uh, about, I think he has, I don't know how many, he has a number of enlargers so that he can move from enlarger to enlarger and do these multiple exposures on a single photograph. Look up Jerry Yulesman, you will not be sorry. He has uh, so much work that sharing two is just completely inadequate. Uh, so I'm gonna leave on that high note and then I want you to go to the link and take a look at some of the interesting and very controversial examples of photo manipulation in the news media. Another important topic and uh, very important that you review that because it'll be part of our discussion.